uh, what is nowadays the uh, best way to analyze uh, the uh, genetic abnormality in myeloma. So we know that karyotype should not be used uh, in myeloma because it is informative in a very, very small number of patients, 10 to 30 percent in the best uh, labs. We know that uh, when uh, successful, karyotypes are usually very complex with several lines of uh, uh, results. And uh, despite this uh, quite uh, disappointing results, cytogenetics has been uh, able to identify some abnormalities which are important for uh, prognosis. And uh, I did list here uh, five uh, high risk abnormalities, 17P deletion, 1P deletion, the two translocations, 414, 1416, and to a lesser extent, 1Q gains. When we look at the results uh, for overall survival for these patients, you can see that this is a whole uh, IFM study, but I don't think it changed uh, uh, really much in the, the past years. We know that 17P is probably the worst abnormality, and you can see that the median overall survival of these patients is something uh, between two and three years. One question which is not totally resolved is, do we need to have a cutoff uh, for assessing 17P? We do believe that patients with a deletion in only 30% of the plasma cells, this is not a prognostic uh, value. In contrast, uh, patients with a major clone with uh, the 17P deletion, more than 50 or 60 percent, definitely these patients are really high risk. The second one is a 414 translocation, and you can see that the median overall survival for this patient is between uh, three and four years. It is present in about 10 percent, 12 percent of the patients. It has been said that uh, when you are treating this patient with 414 with proteasome inhibitor, you will uh, improve the survival. We have conflicting results uh, with that, and uh, I probably need uh, to have a new uh, analysis with a new proteasome inhibitor to confirm or not this uh, finding. 1P32, you can see that the median overall survival is two years. So this is a quite new abnormality. Uh, we can detect it by fish, but I will show you uh, in a moment that uh, fish is not uh, always able to identify this abnormality, but definitely I think it should be uh, included in the panel of probes uh, assessed at diagnosis. Once you gain, uh, some investigators uh, put this abnormality in the high risk uh, group of patients. You can see that this abnormality is quite frequent, uh, about one third of the patients. But you can see also that the median overall survival for this patient is uh, something like five years. So it is totally different from 1Q, uh, from 1P and 17P deletion. And for me, I would not put uh, this abnormality in the two IOS patients. Recently, we did show that uh, the prognostic value of 414 or 17P, uh, for example, could be uh, counterbalanced by other abnormalities, and especially, especially trisomies. And you can see here, you have the patients with 414 alone or 17P alone, but in yellow here, you have the patient with the 414 plus trisomy 3 or trisomy 5, and you can see that at this time, uh, the prognosis is as a standard uh, patient. This is not uh, exactly the same for 17P. When you have 17P deletion plus a trisomy 3 or 5, you are improving the prognosis, but you are not overcoming the poor prognosis of 17P. In contrast, when you are looking at trisomy 21, we had the surprise to see that when you have a trisomy 21 plus a 414 or a 17P, you are worsening the prognosis. Here you have the patient with 414 plus trisomy 21, 17P plus trisomy 21. And here <laughs> you have the patient with either 414 alone or uh, tw uh, trisomy 21 alone, which is probably also a uh, high-risk uh, feature. 
So nowadays, uh, the question is, what is the optimal technique to detect these abnormalities? And even if at the end I will uh, conclude that the future is probably NGS, I do believe that nowadays and for many countries, uh, fish is still the gold standard to analyze these abnormalities. We can also use uh, CGH or SNP array that will be able to detect all the copy number changes, but this means that we need to perform uh, the 414 by fish uh, to detect it. And this is an example uh, of uh, SNP array. So you have uh, 200 patients in each column. Uh, here you have all the abnormalities from chromosome 1 to chromosome 22. In blue you have the losses, in red you have the gains. So you can see here you have all the hyperdiploid patients with the trisomy 3, 5, 7, 9, etc. You can see here you have many patients with deletion of 1P. Here you have many patients with gain of 1Q. So this can help to define some uh, subgroups of myeloma based on the chromosomal abnormalities. I told you before that uh, if you are using fish to analyze the, uh, the, uh, the deletion 1P, uh, you have to be uh, cautious. And you can see here in these patients analyzed by SNP hour, you can see here 1Q gain, you can see here a deletion of 1P, and you can see here you have a very, very small uh, double uh, biallelic deletion of 1P. Uh, targeting the silicon 2 c genes and the FAF1 genes. But if you are using fish, you won't be able to identify this small uh, deletion because the probes will attach uh, on uh, each border and uh, you will uh, have at least one signal. What about mutations? So uh, many, many, I think uh, nowadays probably eight or to 900 Patients have been sequenced, at least at the exome level. You can see here that uh, in median we have 60 mutations uh, per exome. And you can see that we have a huge uh, d diversity between uh, these patients with probably something like 20 mutations and these patients with almost 500 mutations. I think this is important uh, nowadays in the context of using some checkpoint inhibitors because it has been shown that uh, there is a good correlation between the mutation load and the efficacy of these uh, checkpoint inhibitors. And I would not be very surprised that uh, checkpoint inhibitor will have a good effect in these patients, but uh, will minor or no effect in these uh, low mutated patients. We know that myeloma is in the middle uh, when you are looking at the number of mutations. Here you have the leukemias, here you have melanomas, lung cancer, and uh, myeloma is in the middle. And again, uh, this is uh, an argument to say that uh, checkpoint inhibitors are very effective in these patients, and uh, in these patients I won't be very sure that it will work. When we are looking at the different mutations observed in these patients, uh, again, we see a huge heterogeneity. You can see that the most mutated genes are the WAS gene, KWAS in 23, NWAS in 20%, and after you are going to 10% or even much lower. And uh, this is really different than uh, other uh, hematological malignancy like uh, uh, Waldenström or cell leukemia, where we have a single mu mu mutation in myeloma. It is really, really heterogeneous, and we don't see any, except maybe BUF, we don't see any uh, druggable uh, mutations that could be used to try to propose targeted therapy. And uh, when you are looking at the number of mutations, uh, the more mutations you have, the worse is the prognosis. So the prognostic implication of uh, these mutations is not so easy. We have many, many data. However, we don't see uh, any prognostic impact of the most frequent mutations, such as the WAS, 
D3, B wave, FAM46C. The only one which is important, I think, is the mutation uh, uh, targeting the TP53, and probably uh, patients with no mutation, with no deletion, but a mutation, probably have, have the same worse prognosis than patients with 17P deletion. And all the other uh, mutations are really rare, and uh, we will need uh, probably thousands of patients to identify some mutations that could be associated with good or poor prognosis. We can use uh, this uh, mutation to try to identify the subclonal evolution. So we know that in myeloma, subclones are present very early in uh, the uh, oncogenetic uh, process, probably uh, as soon as the anger stage. We know that the major clone at relapse may differ from the one uh, present at diagnosis. And the question is, uh, is the selection uh, done by the therapeutic pressure, or it is an evolution which is patient-dependent? And so to answer this question, we did perform uh, targeted exome sequencing in 46 patients. All the patients have been treated with VTD, male 200 VTD. We did analyze at diagnosis and first relapse. And uh, the question was, are we able to identify a specific mutation selection? And as you can see here, the answer is no. We don't have any uh, specific profile at relapse as compared to diagnosis. So again, I don't think that the clonal selection is due to the treatment alone. It is probably based on the patient itself. And so to finish, uh, what is the future for risk assessment? I do believe that uh, targeted exam sequencing will be the, the future for uh, analysis of the risk. And so we did develop uh, with uh, our colleague uh, Nikhil Munshi and the Sanger Institute in uh, Cambridge uh, panel, which can, be, uh, which can analyze all the copy number changes, for example, 17P deletion, 1P deletion, 1Q gains, all the trisomies, all the 14Q32 translocation. And I think nowadays it will be important to identify also the 1114, especially in the context of treatment with venetoclax. And we can also identify the mutation. And just an example here, uh, a patient analyzed at diagnosis the external circle and relapse. You can see we can identify here the trisomy 3, trisomy 5, trisomy 9, trisomy 11, trisomy 19. And at relapse, we do identify a deletion of 17P plus a mutation of the TP53 uh, genes. And so this patient at diagnosis was probably good prognosis because of the trisomies and at the time of relapse, because of this deletion and mutation, this patient is becoming high risk. So, again, uh, for many countries, this technique is not available, and so I do believe that uh, we should continue to use FISH for the uh, prognostic assessment, but uh, I do believe that in the next uh, two or three years, uh, sequencing will be the basis. I thank you for your attention.